On behalf of the New York Wine and Grape Foundation, we welcome you to New York Wines Online, Bud Break in New York with Alice Wise. While we wait for everyone to get logged in, we would like to review a few logistical details. If you find yourself with streaming issues, please limit other internet users in your office or household. You may need to close out all other open browsers, or you may also find it helpful to log out and log back in with Firefox or Chrome. We have two forms of communication for today's webinar, the chat and the Q&A sections. The chat section is an informal way for you to communicate with other attendees. Be sure to select all panelists and attendees in the drop down to field, as it can default to panelists only. Additionally, we have a Q&A section. This is a way for you to ask questions of our on-screen panelists. Be sure to enter any questions for the panelists in the separate Q&A section. We will do our best to get to all of the questions. Today's webinar is being recorded and streamed to Facebook Live and will be available to all attendees after the webinar. To begin today's webinar, I would like to introduce Alice Wise. For the last 34 years, Alice has worked as the grape specialist for Cornell Cooperative Extension of Suffolk County. Based in Riverhead on the east end of Long Island, she manages a two acre research vineyard and conducts applied research in commercial vineyards. Her main focus has been evaluation of vinifera and hybrid grape varieties, as well as investigations into low impact and organic vineyard management techniques. We are excited to have her here today to lead the conversation with our esteemed panel. Alice, I'll hand the mic to you. Okay, thanks, Rebecca. Uh, welcome, everyone, to Bud Break. Um, this is a really exciting time, I think, in, in the New York wine and grape industry. You know, after a year of uh, worry, you know, I think last year we really didn't know how things were going to play out. Uh, for our businesses and it ended up being uh, a decent year in terms of both sales. A lot of people were able to, to capitalize on online sales. There were a lot of deliveries and mother nature was good to us also. We had a really uh, nice warm dry year and we live for those years in the Eastern US. So I think it's, it's an exciting time. Um, the Wine and Grape Foundation is, has a new initiative with sustainable viticulture. Now we have a program here on Long Island, but the foundation is looking to take it statewide. So that's gonna take a lot of, of planning and a lot of work, but I think it's a really exciting time for our industry. So today we're going to visit some different regions in the state. And we're gonna travel from the east end of Long Island all the way up to the Finger Lakes and then uh, finish in Western New York. So I'd like to, at this time, introduce the panelists. And uh, starting out things will be Peter Weiss from Weiss Vineyards in Hammondsport, New York. And that's on the east side of Keuka Lake in the Finger Lakes. And then from the west side of Cayuga Lake in the Finger Lakes, we have Julia Hoyle and Cameron Hosmer from a Hosmer Estate Winery. Uh, from Long Island, Thomas Spodek from Lens, the Lens Winery on the North Fork of Long Island, right down the street from me. And then finally, Chris Kane from 21 Bricks Winery, and that's in Portland, New York, in the Lake Erie region. There we have our map. And you can see that uh, there's a lot of diversity in New York. Uh, whether it's the moderated maritime climate of the east end of Long Island or uh, the Finger Lakes, where a lot of the vineyards are situated next to the lakes and enjoy those moderating effects, and then all the way to Lake Erie. I think that's a, a pretty cool, pretty cool uh, thing. So... Um, um, now it's, uh, I guess it's, it's me, Peter Weiss. Uh, yes. for the People that um, don't uh, know me, we are, we are a new winery up on uh, Cuca Lake and the Finger Lakes. And um, uh, the picture that I took yesterday that uh, came actually out of our um, Chardonnay vineyard just up the road, we are we're located on uh, Cuca Lake on the east side. So we, are, uh, we have water bodies around that protects uh, the butts uh, through the season, but also uh, climates. Um, um, 
the buds up. So here is a picture of our, um, of, from our tasting room, uh, from our old tasting room on the right side. Um, it's a one room schoolhouse, it's, uh, our winery. Well, we started our winery in seven, 2017, but the farm got built in 1887. On the right side is a uh, uh, one room schoolhouse uh, where we proceed our tastings from. And right next to it is a, a nice a old barn uh, with nice rustic beams and uh, gives a nice flair. And uh, the big square, um, shiny square, that's actually uh, our new tasting room. Um, that we started in November and now, of course, uh, looks totally different. Um, so with the view on uh, uh, on the bluff for Kuka Lake, for the ones that don't know how uh, Kuka Lake is uh, shaped, Kuka Lake is shaped like a Y. So I call it a special lake. Um, and um, that the island we're looking at, that's actually as uh, a bluff. Uh, Kuka Lake is 183 feet deep. That um, uh, it's not the deepest lake uh, in Finger Lakes, but uh, since we are on the uh, east side of Kuka Lake, it still um, protects us from uh, the harsh winter um, winds that, because the water body actually climates um, uh, the, the cold temperatures. And uh, today, are uh, you probably, yeah, today uh, for the ones for you guys that actually have our dry Riesling, um, might as well, while I'm talking, you can start uh, tasting it. Uh, this one here, uh, the picture is actually a uh, of our farm that we just acquired just a quarter mile up the road. And it shows um, uh, the vineyards. Um, on the bottom part, uh, we have Riesling, Chardonnay, Cap Francs, and then uh, further up are natives, uh, Niagara, uh, Concord, Catawbers that we don't make wine from, um, but in, in the future, we're going to um, convert them all to viniferous, uh, mainly Rieslings, uh, Cap Francs. Uh, we are in general, um, um, yeah, mainly uh, focused on Rieslings. Uh, that is another picture of um, what I took yesterday, uh, our uh, Cap Francs. And here in front of me, I have um, some Chardonnays. Uh, they're a little bit further out than Riesl Rieslings and a small Riesling vine is here. When you see uh, the buds there, the Rieslings are just a little bit behind. I see, uh, um, yeah, Thomas and Chris are looking at the butts. Uh, you guys are probably much further ahead uh, than we are down in the finger legs. We're about, we're about the same. There's some that's out a little bit more than that. So Peter, let's back up a little bit and uh, talk about the fact that you grew up in Germany in a wine growing family. Could you explain a little bit about your background and how you landed in the finger legs? Yes, yeah, so everybody I, um, is tasting? Yeah, I'm, I'm a German import. Uh, I came over, um, I grew up in a small family winery in Germany. So I, um, how it is in small wineries, uh, you do kind of everything. And um, my family basically uh, babysit me in the vineyards. Uh, the Mosel River is uh, quite steep. So um, um, yeah, there's a lot of handwork to do. You can't just drive with a tractor through it uh, like we used to here. That makes uh, things a little bit more complicated. Uh, I graduated winemaking, agriculture, and business uh, in Germany in, um, in Bad Kreuznach. And uh, in 2005, I actually went to Sonoma. I uh, worked uh, in a winery there called Schuch. And then in uh, 2006, I uh, came uh, to New York. And uh, I was going to go to Australia and New Zealand at the time, but ended up um, coming closer to home, uh, not just distance wise, but also um, style wise, ter uh, terroir style. The Finger Lakes have a lot of um, slate, um, just uh, what I'm used to uh, from home. And uh, for me, uh, that's where Riesling has to grow, um, just to get that minerality, um, like that freshness. So what, you, what you're hopefully uh, tasting in my, uh, my Riesling, uh, it's just like just Christmas uh, minerality. Um, and then um, 2006, I actually uh, started working at Dr. Frank's. Um, a friend of mine who I graduated with went uh, there and um, I visited him in November uh, 2005, and uh, I liked the cold New York that much uh, that I had to come here. Um, and yeah, and worked there until um, yeah, 17. It's when we started our winery, my, my wife and me, um, and the, the rest is history. So you had a big year in 2020. You, had, you and your wife had a baby, 
and you planted a vineyard all in the same year. Yeah, and uh, don't forget the tasting room that we started uh, uh, in November. And the tasting uh, room. So like, uh, there's, there's a lot of things happening, but uh, ex exciting things. But uh, definitely uh, keep us up on our toes. Yeah, makes me tired to think about it. So it's a good thing you're young. <laughs> And uh, you planted uh, Riesling, Chardonnay, Cab Franc, and Saparavi. Yep, Saparavi, actually. Um, and we got a great help from, uh, from Tim, uh, Tim Hosmer, uh, you know, who Tonka here is, uh, you know, in the video. Right. And uh, for those of you in the audience, Saparavi is, it's a uh, Georgian, like Eastern Europe, Georgia. Georgian variety and it's a red, it's a cold hardy red. And I have it in my vineyard here. I have a variety trial and um, it's, it's, a, it's pretty cool. It's very dark and it's very juicy. And uh, how would you describe, because you've been making Sabarevi wine. Yeah, so like um, uh, from the grow perspective, I worked, started working with, with it in 2008. Mm -hmm. uh, this is actually when I planted it. Uh, uh, for Dr. Franks and um, to me, uh, Saparavi is you know, full of flavor. It's actually a variety that every year since I've been working with it uh, makes a nice dense uh, red. Our uh, tenants right. are a little softer, so you may have to, uh, I like to beef it up with a little bit more new oak just to give it a nice full body, but it gives uh, in general like uh, makes a really good wine uh, every year where uh, in New York with let's say, for example, Cap Softs could be a little bit tougher, but Saparavia definitely yeah. um, is uh, consistent. Right. And there's a question, is it a thicker skin grape and easy to grow? I don't think any grapes are easy to grow. It's, 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 def it's definitely easy to grow. Uh, like you probably know, it, is, um, uh, it grows straight straight up. Uh, it's not uh -huh. like finicky, like Pinot Noir, because Pinot Noir likes to uh, lay down. Uh, Saparavia is going straight out. Um, uh, since we had a butt break event, uh, there's always like uh, not. Is there always a little bit fussy, uh, slightly fussy on um, on the leaves uh, on the backside? Not like Pinot Meunier, but uh, Saparavi, uh, you know, has a touch fussy. So that's how I, how you can uh, differentiate um, mm -hmm. uh, the different leaves or different okay. varieties. Um, Peter, before we get to the next question, could you just describe your Riesling since everybody's tasting that? Yeah. And I'd like to invite the other panelists to chime in as well with their comments. So like um, with my reasoning, I, I personally get some nice uh, stone for like a white peach on it, but um, also like and when, when you taste it, a nice zestiness. Yeah, 2019 that's, is a great... That's what I'm um, saying, like... A, I get a nice freshness um, that uh, mainly uh, my dry reason comes from Cuca Lake, but also southern end of Seneca Lake, where um, kind of mostly from, uh, from uh, vineyards that have a lot of slate. Mm -hmm. And Julia, you were saying? I was saying 2019 was a great year just for great acidity and that strong linear quality as well. And a lot of Finger Lakes Rieslings and whites in general, but a really sort of long, cool growing season. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, the Finger Lake certainly knows how to do Riesling. I will, I will give you all that. And I, I definitely detected the peachy yesterday. Any other comments from panelists? I think that's a very nice wine and has won some awards for sure. Yeah, I'll just finish the same. It's a very nice wine. Uh, Peter, nice job there. Uh, good Christmas all the way through, the minerality shining, uh, the fruit nuance through there, just it nice. Lingers, lay, lays on there, want that second sip. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, Peter, correct me if I'm wrong, that's $17.99? Yeah, it's $17.99 and uh -huh. uh, um, distributing like throughout New York, um, mainly uh, Rochester, um, Rochester, Buffalo, Syracuse area, but um, any store that likes to carry us, we, uh, you know, okay. and, and a restaurant, uh, we're glad to distribute. Uh, we're distributing for, throughout um, New York with d &T. So uh, within, yeah, two days, you can have our product. Okay. Um, we have 
time for just one or two quick questions. And Bob Mandil, Peter, is asking you, what role do you see for lees and texture for dry Riesling? What role? Uh, what so roles do you see for lees and texture? Um, standard. So yeah, I definitely going to get, uh, get um, yeah, leave my lees or my wines on the lees uh, until uh, the end. So like, for example, my dry Riesling is still on the lees. I haven't bottled it yet. And, and right before bottling, that's when I go into, um, yeah, filter it one time um, until I filter it uh, for bottling again. So, so least contact with Rieslings are a, a must for me, or a standard, uh, I would kind of like say, and um, that will actually gives me, um, yeah, gives a lot of texture. Mm -hmm. Weight, uh, like a little bit creaminess in some years uh, where you have higher acidity, you actually want to have the least contact to um, to buffer up the acidity, but will still basically will hide it a little bit. Um, one question that I didn't get to, Peter, you mentioned you were able to use more machinery in the vineyards in the Finger Lakes versus the Mosul. What other differences are there between the two grape regions? That's a probably a question um, that would take a while to answer. So what is the difference? Um, yeah, so just we, name one or two things. Uh, what we have, um, yeah, big thing is um, the Mosul River or Mosul region was quite um, um, quite cold um, when I was growing up uh, or even before that. That's what I hear from my, from my family. So uh, back in the day, they uh, were uh, doing techniques um, like we were still doing in the Finger Lakes. So in the 80s, for example, uh, there were... Um, um, they were healing up uh, the vines because um, some some frosts um, or, or basically winter frosts, winter was, could be harsher, so they were actually healing up. And that's what we're actually doing now in the finger legs as well. Mm -hmm. um, healing up the, you know, the grafts uh, to protect the, the rootstock, or actually not the rootstock, to protect the, um, the vinifera a part of it. And and that's what we, luck, uh, luckily in Germany, my, uh, my friends and family uh, don't have to do that anymore, but we still have to do to protect um, uh, mm -hmm. the Nifer grapes. Okay. And uh, you feel that the lees broadens the mid palate? That was a question. Yes, uh, yeah, it broadens the mid palate, uh, depending, you know, uh, to, to get the acidity rounded up. Okay. Well, good job and congratulations on all the new stuff in your life. And um, I hope that, you know, being a new business that you find great success. And, um, and I think unless there are other questions, we're gonna move on to the next winery. And that would be Julia Hoyle and Cameron Hosmer from Hosmer Estate Winery. Yeah. Hello, we of course have a tractor going by. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, you know. Cameron, you've been in business for a long time 40 years. You're one of the elder statesmen of the, the grape industry. And Julia, you're kind of um, not a newcomer, but sort of, sort of, kind of a newcomer. So, I think it's a really um, interesting pairing. And, um, mm -hmm. and your son is also involved in the business. He runs the vineyard and has a really cool vineyard management company where he travels around and does custom planting for people. That so you've got a lot going on there. Yep. Yeah, a lot. Um, I wanna ask you, Cameron, what's your biggest challenge in the vineyard? Well, the, the biggest challenge, and, and Peter reflected on that, of course, is winter. You know, we're in the Finger Lakes, and uh, our, our frost-free date here is May 15th, so we're really not out of the woods yet, and as you saw the pictures that Peter showed you of the buds, they're pretty susceptible right now, and I think if the temperature dropped to, oh, 28 degrees Fahrenheit, we'd probably have a problem. Mm -hmm. and, and then in the winter, you know, if the, if the temperature starts with a line in front of it, Fahrenheit, we don't really care for that. That means below zero. And, and like we say that, you know, bad things happen in, in the winter, and, you know, with the vinifera varieties that we grow, what I like to say is 
at minus five Fahrenheit, bad things start to happen. And <laughs> lower than that, bad things happen fast. So, you know, it's, it's a lot of, you know, a lot of finger crossing and a lot of management tools that we do. Peter mentioned about healing up. I mean, that's something that I've been doing since day one to mm-hmm. protect the graft. So these are grafted vines so that the, the, the root is on a resistant rootstock for this critter that lives in the soil called phylloxera. And, and the roots that we plant, these vinifera varieties, which is Riesling Chardonnay, Cabernet Franc, uh, are grafted on various rootstocks that are resistant to this little critter that lives in the soil. So, and, and so we, we hill up the vines, we, 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 pot, we plow dirt over that graft at the very base of the soil. So that in the fact, if we do have to, to insulate the top portion of the vine, the, the, the fruiting portion of the vine. So if we have a disastrous, and we have had over the years, some pretty serious you know, winter occasions where we had to basically start from scratch and grow the vine back up from the ground. But a couple mm-hmm. of inches of soil is an incredible insulator. And uh, it's, a pro, you know, it's, a, it's a procedure that most growers do nowadays. And, and you know, we got, we got a little, some of us got a little lazy, not me, but some of us growers in the Finger Lakes, you know, we had a warm stretch for a while there. And they said, oh, we don't need to do this tedious task of healing up because the, you know, it's, it's a lot of work and the grapes are, are going to survive well. We were proved wrong in some years and, and in some cases whole vineyards were lost which is mm-hmm. uh, you know, a real setback, very expensive hit for replant. So mm-hmm. I, I think that the lesson has been learned basically across the board in this uh, grape growing region. Yeah. Throughout the Gra- state of New York. Grapes is a humbling experience. That's it for sure. sure. Is. Now you've also kind of hedged your bet by growing some hybrids too. And Julia, I want to ask you, um, what's your favorite hybrid? Oh, <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> So I do <laughs> lean vinifera, um, but you know, probably for sure what we have planted here, probably save all Blanc. Um, mm-hmm. You can just do a little bit more with it. And, you know, we sell most of it, but it is usually a blending component in actually a, our house red wine of all things. Um, but it's fun because you can do some barrel ferments, you can do stainless steel. Um, so probably save all Blanc but mm-hmm. I definitely lean a little vinifera. <laughs> and that so Saval was planted in 19, I planted it in 1976. Oh, how about that? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So I was driving by that when I was racing from Ithaca to Geneva. <laughs> so yeah. if everybody could uh, go ahead and taste the 2018 Chardonnay from Hosmer while we uh, continue our, our discussion. Um, so I want to ask you to, you have five acres that you have to plant this year. What are you going to plant? What would you like to plant? Cabernet what Franc. What more of? Cabernet Franc for sure. For sure. We never seem to have enough. It's very reliable variety of the red vinifera. It's the most reliable uh, red vinifera that we grow. It, it gets ripe. It makes nice wine. It, uh, I agree. It's reliable. It, it's mm-hmm. fairly winter hardy, in in in, and it's not. It's fairly rot resistant, and ripens before Cabernet Sauvignon. So it's a you know mid to late October. I mean, we stretch the season with it and get it as ripe as we can, mm-hmm. and but it holds up. So you know, it's a variety that we can pick when we not want to, not when we have to. And there's a big difference there. Yeah. Big oh yeah. Yeah. I would it's say nice the other one, um, if I was feeling a little bullish would actually probably be Chardonnay. Um, Cause I think mm-hmm. that I can, I expect going forward, there'll be a higher demand for it. And there already is a high demand. There is. We usually don't have much to sell, um, mm-hmm. but I could see going forward, there being a steeper demand both for still and sparkling production. It's a flexible, Reliable yeah. and flexible variety. Yep, it crops right. well. It does well over winter, typically. Yeah, okay. it's yeah. suitable so, for sparkling. 
It can make uh -huh. a barrel fermented style, a richer, heavier style. You can make it. We're seeing a lot of traction in the lesser oak Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the customer seems to be leaning towards that with, a, you know, mm -hmm. the oak influence is less. So, yeah. and, um, you know, okay. this particular wine was, uh, the, it, it was, I planted it in 1979. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was back when, uh, clones of Chardonnay were really not, I mean, we didn't talk about clones. It was Chardonnay was Chardonnay, and that was that. And, and you know, when things have changed since then, there's, you know, multiple clones of Chardonnay. And uh, something interesting, these vines came from the, uh, the, the propagation material came from Cornell uh, in, in Geneva. They had a, a, a business called fruit testing. So they oh, I remember. Uh -huh. basically a nursery there and uh, and so we got the Chardonnay from them and it was on a rootstock much to my, because I was new, I didn't know much about rootstocks either, but it was on a rootstock known as 5BB, which is very vigorous. And oh, that's a I, terrible rootstock. Like, okay, 5BB is fine with me. But, you know, looking yep. back, I probably could have chosen a different rootstock and early on it was way too vigorous. And, yeah. you know, it's a lesson learned. It's grown right. into its own now, though. Oh, it's, sure has. It's my favorite Chardonnay block now. It just took, you know, almost 40 years. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Sounds like some people take some till they're 40 to. <laughs> so there's a couple of questions for you. What role does the Seval Blanc play in the red? Is it co-fermented? Uh, it is not co-fermented. It gets blended in later. So it's our house red is pretty much all hybrid components. It's Deshaunac base. Um, and then, which is a very dark, inky red wine. Um, and then save all, um, occasionally a little bit of Chardonnay. If I have a couple red vinifera barrels that, you know, maybe I don't want to put towards our standard vinifera program, they might get blended in as well. Mm -hmm. and, and why do we put white wine in this red blend? Because it makes it better. <laughs> oh, no, I've, I've heard of that. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's not uncommon. It's pretty simple. Uh, it makes see. it better. Couple more questions. Uh, given that virtually one in four bottles of wine purchased in the U.S. is Chardonnay, could you at some point share your view of the Hosmer Finger Lake Chardonnay within the broad spectrum available in the U.S.? Sure. All right. Yeah. Hmm, that's a question. That, that's that sounds a, like a Bob question. You're, you're uh, <laughs> absolutely right. Char Chardonnay is the most widely planted grape variety in the world. It's grown in 40 countries. Mm -hmm. And I think there's like 700,000 acres of Chardonnay worldwide. So it's a big player. And, and uh, in the Finger Lakes, I think that what we've seen is, uh, you know, there hasn't been a lot of traction. That, uh, you know, it was planted in the, in the late 70s and early 80s pretty significantly. And then there was kind of a stall. I think it was a little bit overplanted at that point. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's, we're seeing a sort of a resurgence of, of Chardonnay here in the Finger Lakes and this, you know, fruit forward style, which, you know, we have these warm days and cool nights, which helps preserve that the fruit character, which, you know, Riesling really shines in those kind of conditions mm -hmm. and, and so does Chardonnay. So, you know, yeah. it's a, friendlier version and the alcohol doesn't need to be 14 and a half percent you know a, a little lower alcohol right. which the customer wants yeah. lower alcohol and i think one of the advantages that we enjoy in the east is natural acidity that i think makes the wines really uh, well balanced and tasty there was yes. a, a question about comparing your the east coast chardonnay to the west coast chardonnay and i think that's one big Yep, yeah, that freshness, Different. more alcohol, and you know, I expect that that style of Chardonnay is going to really sink in and be around for a while now. We have a small customer base, you know, wants big buttery Chardonnays. Well, it's not really what we do, right? We, ha we have right. Chardonnay. That's not what we're going to do, though. So, yeah. you know, you can give them a list of a few other producers that might be of interest, um, but I think mm -hmm. that we really have a niche that you know, in the next decade or two, we'll be able to fill out and, you know, the acidity as well for sparkling wine. Chardonnay, it tastes great at 18 bricks, you know, in late mm -hmm. September. So it does make a great sparkler. 
Yeah. Are you making any um, making any pet nut? No, <laughs> I leave that to our neighbors. <laughs> Okay, panelists, any comments on the Hosmer 2018 Chardonnay? Uh, well made, you get, get nice aromatic, get some oak, but not too much, and uh, throughout a nice balance uh, between screaminess and, and the oak. And old vines, too. I think that's a real privilege in the Eastern U.S. when you get to taste wines from vines that are older than a lot of your employees. <laughs> oh, yeah. Older than me. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, older than you, no. Julia. <laughs> yeah. Well, it just shows you that, that you know, you, these vines can hang in there if you take care of them. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't just ignore them. They're, they're like kids. You got to pay attention to them. <laughs> right, Peter? <laughs> yes, make sure you, they don't have wet feet, you know, and then you're good. Yeah. <laughs> the kids or the vines? Both of them. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Okay. So any, um, we'll finish up, I think, by saying, uh, Julia and Cameron, anything new going on in the vineyard this year then? Are you planting anything? Are you uh, actually no. planting anything? No, we, we're, we're not planting anything here. We're, uh, you know, do, we're actually, yesterday we did some replants with, so mine's, you know, there's a certain mortality in the vineyard every year. So we go through every single year and replace vines that are missing, whether they got, you know, hit by the tractor or for one reason or another, just, you know, are, we're no longer viable. So, you know, that's a process that we do every year. But uh, and they were in the Chardonnay just yesterday. We planted too. Chardonnay yeah. replants. and replants in Chardonnay yesterday. Yeah. And uh, that's just a process that, you know, you do every year to keep your vineyard viable i mean missing spaces are are not profitable so you know that's what we keep after mm -hmm. and the conditions yesterday were basically the first time this year where we could get in the field and do that so uh -huh. we're uh, yeah it's been it's been raining here too yep and okay uh, my son tim will be he's planting in connecticut today but uh he'll be back with our our fairly sophisticated planting machine mm -hmm. And uh, we'll be starting here in the Finger Lakes soon mm -hmm. to plant, custom plant for various yeah. people. And Cameron's talking about a laser planter and it's impo important to use um, the latest technology and plant nice straight rows because that helps with mechanization. Mm -hmm. When you start having vineyards where the rows are crooked or the trunks are sticking out, then you do things like you hit them with a tracker. Not saying I've ever done that. <laughs> <laughs> And that's how you straighten the row out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you both. Good job and uh, all the best for a good season in 2021. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, so we're now we're going to travel down to Long Island or right up the road from where I am now and meet Thomas Spodek, who is the winemaker there. And Thomas, I was uh, interested to see that you were in the military. Thank you for your service. Yes, I was. <laughs> uh-huh, you were in the Marines? I was, yeah, and that's kind of where, uh, how it kind of led me to here. I was I was kind of underage and didn't, all my friends were drinking and I couldn't uh, buy booze. So I was making beer and wine eventually in my uh, barracks room, which uh, led when I was getting out of the military didn't know what to do with my life. And I kind of took a job here actually at Lens with Eric Fry underneath him uh, to kind of just pursue a hobby. Didn't realize there was a career behind it. Um, mm -hmm. Led me to going to Washington State for study under Dr. Hen um, Thomas Hennickling out there to learn how to make wine. And Oh, and back. Thomas. Thomas is a great winemaker. He was, <laughs> he was at Cornell. I love Thomas. Yes. Um, Thomas Hennickling is currently the director of Vitneology at Washington State. Yeah, so I, I studied under him and then uh, went to South Africa and then landed back here on Long Island at home where I wanted to be. So it all worked out. Very nice. Very nice. And uh, your dad also. So you have a family connection, right? Your dad was a viticulturist in Virginia? He, he is now. Yeah, he uh, bought yeah. a vineyard, I believe, about six years ago in Virginia. Oh, okay. Uh, 
of Spotsylvania. So yeah, he was into it, the hobby as well. And we both, you know, we you know, did it together, you know, here and there together and kind of would, I was doing it down in North Carolina and we we're kind of competing, making bottles and, Oh, which uh -huh. one tastes good, which one tastes bad. So yeah. So instead of going into viticulture, you crossed over to the dark side and went into winemaking. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's more fun so, work. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas has the privilege of working with someone that I think is probably one of the best vineyard managers in the eastern U.S. and that's Sam McCullough and I'm calling him out because he wouldn't come on camera <laughs> but um, he's he's a great cooperator for research projects and he's one of the more innovative vineyard managers I've had the privilege to work with so I'd like to to yeah, acknowledge so, him and tell you how lucky you are now who gets to work with him he, you know he's been here at lens for I believe, 30 years now right. so it's, it's very you know knows every vine vine by vine and it, every nothing gets by him he knows mm -hmm. he's very attentive so who calls the shots if it's getting <laughs> to be harvest time who gets to decide when blocks are harvested because i know yeah. that eric was a Eric Fry, your mentor, was a let it hang kind of guy. Yeah, so uh, Sam and I work pretty well together. We uh, we get along real well, and and we kind of he's able to persuade me, and I'm able to persuade him, depending on what you know the project is. I, I do bedge heads a lot, and he, you know, if I pick half a block, he's he's open to leaving half out hanging sometimes. So it it uh, we work well well together. Don't butt heads, him and Eric did. <laughs> I heard about that once or twice. <laughs> so let's uh, let's all go ahead and taste Thomas's Firefly Rosé from 2019. And Thomas, maybe while uh, everybody's tasting, you can talk about your use, creative use of varieties in this. That's an interesting uh, blend of varieties. Yes. All of our red varieties and uh, a little bit of Gewürztraminer are actually thrown in. So uh, this project, Firefly, started in 2016. Um, and in 2016, what happened was a cold, cold, uh, cold summer, cold fall, wet fall. And we had our Cab, Cab Sauv block that was just kind of behind. And we had a tropical storm rolling up like the last week of, November, of uh, October, I believe it was, that Sam and I had to get together and kind of say, okay, what are we going to do? And we decided that the acidity, there was nice acidity to the fruit. It just didn't want to be a red wine. So we picked it and made a rosé out of it. And the rosé had just a huge popularity behind it. So it's kind of become almost like a fun pet project for me. Mm -hmm. um, and we've made it every year. It's become actually our number one seller um, uh, across our wine club and you know around here. And I really kind of just had a lot of fun. So it, I've, we now grow Cab Sauv just for this wine. Oh, wow. uh, we, we also grow a little bit of Merlot just for this. And then, so we pick half of it up front, the Cab Sauv and a little bit of Merlot with uh, higher acidity, lower bricks. And then I use uh, uh, the Seigneur technique. So when I took over head winemaking, I introduced the sorting table for our premium red wines. And on that, there's a loss of a little bit of juice, about five to 10% of our juice is, is a loss. But with that riper fruit, juice i actually use it as a you know use the saigne as a, kind of a boost of fruit and character to the to the rosé and then uh i also you know used uh divert streamer made an orange wine it was you know 72 hours on the skins in a barrel uh in an oak barrel that i broke the top off and just put all the grapes right inside and did everything by hand for a couple of days um which really boosted the aromatics and i i kind of i make like eight or nine wines but the 2019 was like eight or nine wines that i made and then blended back into this uh firefly rosé mm -hmm. well it's a delightful wine i think and i really um it does to me scream strawberries yeah any um com comments from the panel fruit i get like a little bit of guava orange blossom um mm -hmm. it's also richer on the palate you, you, you we have a couple different rosés um, the, our other rosés are like more lean and austere, whereas this one's like rich and there's a lot going on. So I just had to make it very different than, you know, you can't have two wines that are strikingly similar. So you had to make them 
different. Definitely like that tropical note, guava, lychee, like you see that Gewurz personality coming out a little bit. On the yeah, it's amazing yeah. how little Gewurz goes in the wine. <laughs> <A long> way. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, and so Thomas, this is your best selling wine, right? It's uh, definitely up there as one of our, you know, highest produced at least. So yeah, I'd say year after year so far since we started. Mm -hmm. And so here, here's harvest underway. Do you hand pick everything or do you machine anything? Uh, so yeah, so I'm, I'm kind of, we ever started, we do have a machine harvester. However, we, since I started, we haven't machine picked once. <laughs> um, you know, we're, we're, we have about 60 acres planted right, you know, right on the estate here. So as you can see in the picture, we bring everything right from the picking logs right into the winery. This is, you know, maybe a 50 yards from my, uh, my press, this picture was taken. So we, we bring everything in by hand and, you know, it doesn't get crushed prior, you know, being in only you know, 25, 30 mm. pound lugs versus, you know, being in a two ton or one ton bin. So the grapes don't compress and, and we get right. kind of the, the fruit whole, you know, it's kind of the freshest you can get grapes in. That's an impressive shot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we're hoping we didn't get to do this in 2020, so we're hoping uh, 2021s that we're able to get back our our what is our, our dinner we do in the middle of the vineyard for our wine club, but it's a, also a great shot. You can kind of see just all our, our whole vineyard out there. Mm -hmm. Boy, drones have really uh, found their way into the grape world. That's for sure. Um, okay. Well, that was. Uh, a delightful wine and thank you. I don't think you and I don't cross paths too often. <laughs> but um yeah, I see Sam. I see Sam a fair amount. Yeah, run by him right down the road. Right. Right. Yeah. Well on weekends I'm doing things like painting my living room. So <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> so so thanks very much, Thomas, and uh, I hope 2021 is good for us on Long Island. We've come off really two really good seasons, so hopefully 2021 continues yeah, so our streak. And our, our first signs of bud break uh, was April 21st was yeah. when we saw the Chardonnay, at least in the um, cane prune Chardonnay we had uh, coming through. The, the spur yeah. prunes always, you know, about two weeks behind, but... But yeah, the case, April 21st, it was, yeah, it, was, it was very early for us, I think. It was early this year, for sure. Hopefully that means early harvest. <laughs> That's my fantasy. Okay. So thanks a lot, Thomas. And I think we'll uh, move on to our final uh, panelist and speaker, Christopher Kane. And Christopher, if you could... Uh, Jump on oh. screen. I bet. There you Should are. Here. Yeah. Hi, Chris. Thank you, Alice. Now, Chris has a really interesting story also in that he's um, farming. They have a vineyard on an old family farm, and you have a lot of grapes, 250 acres of grapes. Yeah. And I'm here to tell you that that's a lot of grapes to far. <laughs> That's a <laughs> lot of work, a lot of work. So um, can you, you know, describe your business and maybe some of your family members? And their Yeah, lives? so, so it is a bit of work. Uh, but I hang out in the winery a lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, uh, I'm a third generation grape farmer. Uh, my grandpa Jordan, who uh, went to Cornell and UC Davis, was a head extension agent for all of uh, Erie and Chautauqua County on the western side of uh, New York State here for for many years from the 60s to the 80s um, helped develop was involved with Nelson Shawless with the Geneva double curtain some trellis techniques and some other things I was just really tied in and then my uh, second generation would be Mike Jordan which is my uh, stepdad and he he in essence is the uh, vineyard manager and the the grower and really the guy that's uh, uh, pushed the needle and the envelope here for uh, Old Chautauqua Farms and really taking it to where it is right now, uh, like I said, Cornell alum. And then I, I was involved in the in the farm growing up. Um, I have some 
got a little leaflet with Peter's wine here and had a picture of him in the vineyard. And I'm sure I have a couple with my uh, papa out there as well. But it was in Lake Erie and out in Germany. Uh, I'm a little jealous. Um, but we, uh, so I grew up in the vineyard doing all the tasks and, uh, you know, tried to steer as far away from it as, as I could because I wasn't, wasn't, it just wasn't for me. Um, so I went to school to be a, a doctor, got a biology degree, but uh, I'm the oldest and, and saw that second generation and, and want to see that legacy kind of carry on. So I came back to the farm and worked at the farm for uh, a good solid year after graduation, uh, went into my second year and just realized it, it truly wasn't my calling at the time. Uh, but I, I, I had that science background and I was interested in, in uh, beverages of all types. Um, and, uh, so I tried dabbing into the winemaking and, and was fortunate enough to end up at a winery down the road from me where I landed for about 15 years before I went off to Australia and, and a little bit of time just traveling through Germany and put a business plan together and came back and, and pitched to my parents about opening our own winery. And mm -hmm. so in 2010, we, uh, we broke ground and, and, um, had our first child at the same time, about 10 years ago. How do you there, Pete? But uh, and then we have four, four children in that same uh, envelope, and and we've I've got a great relationship with my dad. We've taken a lot of the grapes and turned them into wine now. Um, even with all that acreage, I, I probably here at the winery we're producing just shy of 100,000 gallons now, and and I'm I'm only using 15 to 20 percent of, of our own grapes from our farm. So um, there's about 23 different varieties that we grow from uh, vinifera to hybrids to a good large chunk of that 250 is the native grapes that are native to Western New York, Concord, Niagara, uh, about 175 acres. That goes off to the big processors like Welch's uh, Growers Co-op. Um, but that still leaves 75 acres of vinifera and hybrids, which is a lot of work um, and, and, and a different type of uh, farming and management in the vineyard. Um, different techniques and things you got to pay attention to with, uh, as, as Tunk was saying, with the, uh, the hilling up uh, and being, you know, practicing uh, protection from winter injury. And uh, I think winter injury is big, but I would also say spring frost is our, our big, our big concern. We're uh, located on Lake Erie, for those of you who aren't aware of the western part of New York. Um, average depth of Lake Erie is 75 feet, but we're, uh, we're located around a, a deeper section uh, right off where we are in this um, particular region from Fredonia to, to Harbor Creek. It's about 150 to 219 feet at the deepest. Um, so yeah. uh, we like to say we're in the deep part of the lake, but um, we still are susceptible to winter and, and, and we do see those negative uh, degree temperatures uh, getting below, you know, minus five, uh, sometimes colder and it's a little scary. Um, but we, um, we've been fortunate though. We've had, uh, even with some of those winter kills, we've been able to bring things back and, and some of the oldest, uh, wine varietals were, were planted by, uh, uh, Woodbury Vineyards, which was a little bit ahead of their time down here in this region. And so we have some really old vineyards of, uh, Riesling and Chardonnay that were planted in the early eighties, uh, mid eighties, many different clones, some things that they didn't know, um, a seven different, uh, Pinot Noir um planting that was in cooperation with cornell of the, kind of checking out kind of different pinot noirs that grew to this region oh yeah uh, that was bob pool's work right yeah uh -huh. yeah, and yeah i was bob together. pool's grad student yeah oh, that's fantastic so yeah we had uh, yeah. all different varieties of pinot noir from Vadensville and rienfelder and pomard and, and all these different things mm -hmm. that uh, so when i first got into it i was able to to play with and get in and experiment and then i Come to find out that a lot of these experiments were already been made and there was notes and then the old winemaker Woodbury had some good notes so it was quite interesting but all in all I mean I think the the biggest challenge is going back I think is winter but spring frost is my biggest concern lately and, and has been continuously for the past several years as we're warming up earlier and earlier um, uh, we had declared bud break in this region the day before we had our significant frost uh, injury and um for those of you who know, bud break is like in Peter's picture. If you look in his vineyard, you can kind of see uh, that's a little bit beyond bud break where the leaf is actually exposed. But we had uh, cotton exposed and, and things were starting to pop out of the bud. And, and we saw uh, 28 degrees for, for not just one day, but three different nights in a row where we got into the 28. But it hit some of our fringe growing regions up off of the hill. Um, from the Lake Erie shoreline to our, our hillside, it's a 700 foot elevation change. And it, and it spans anywhere from a half a mile to two miles from that, that 
shore of Lake Erie. So within there, and it, it gradually uh, goes in like three different stages from the lake shore up to that 700 foot elevation. So those that were in the 500 to 700 foot elevation certainly saw the frost um, uh, damage the, uh, the, the buds. Um, those that were in the 150 to 200 or 300 foot range in the, along the Route 20 corridor or I-90, um, they, they didn't see as much damage. But, and then along the shoreline, Lake Shore, they were the, slow, the slowest ones typically along Lake Erie Shore. Uh, they, weren't, they weren't out as far. We didn't see the damage there along the shoreline. That's a scary, uh, a scary thing, frost, because that means you get to manage your vineyard still all season and not really harvest a full crop or any crop in some cases. So that's, that's why we worry about that so much. I have to ask you, Chris, what's the deal with the pink elephant? You have a pink <laughs> elephant in front of your vineyard. Well, I'll, I'll give credit to my, uh, my father on that one. We have a large you pick cherry orchard um, there's about at that time there was 20 acres of cherries in a very old grove that was planted in the 60s, and the and the grove was uh, uh, about a half a mile from the main road. And he wanted something that stood out uh, uh, to kind of be a, a showcase to bring people into the driveway, saying, "What is that?" And curiosity slow down and then see the cherry sign to go on the driveway. Um, but that was, that was a gray, gray elephant at that time. And then when I started to open the winery across the street, I moved it over and, uh, um, we painted it yellow first, actually, which was his favorite color. Uh, if you're a farmer, you utilize everything and he had extra harvester paint for his new Gregoire. And so he painted the elephant yellow, which, which didn't go over too well. Uh, and then when I released our pink Catawba, which is a native Labrusca varietal, um, named El Atabo here. Um, I was doing home construction and I saw Home Depot's sexy pink and I said, that's it. Uh, elephants getting painted pink. And <laughs> so we painted her, we painted her pink and I gave a pachyderm, a, um, uh, <laughs> a manicure and a pedicure as I did the nails and everything on it. And it took me about uh, eight hours to paint the thing and it's been pink ever since. And it's just kind of a, a mascot for us. Uh, I could have put a... I, you know, no one recognizes the winery. They always recognize the elephant. And I like to say I could have went about a quarter of the size for the taste room and everything else. and just put the, the winery, the elephant out front and saved a lot of money. <laughs> so uh, hopefully everybody's tasting your Pinot Grigio. We have a, a 2020 Pinot Grigio. And uh, how's that in the vineyard for you? I, I quite like that variety. Yeah, it's, um, it's not my favorite varietal in the vineyard. Uh, the one good thing about Pinot Grigio in the Lake Erie region was we get to harvest this earlier. So this was, uh, we're usually around September 15th, September 25th in that window of being able to harvest. Uh, but the skins are a bit thinner and if we get any moisture, humidity, and uh, there's sometimes whatever clone, depending on the clone, it can be a little tighter. Um, so we're, we're picking them sometimes pretty early um with some good acid retention but also we used to we have a particular clone we can let hang a little bit but we end up getting quite a bit of pink which is nice um and it goes into some of our rosé blends but we like the the pinot grigio our our standalone white varietal here this is our well of the vinifera this is our number three seller for just plain white um and, and it is finished with a little bit of rs uh residual sugar just to kind of fill a, a spot on the tasting sheet um we have several uh dry straight dry wines and this one kind of hits that that middle ground with our semi-dry riesling as a as a semi off dry semi-sweet option and i think it uh helps showcase or bring out the fruit which pinot grigio is a nice wine itself but it's not the um the sexiest at all times it's not the prettiest and and has like the most aroma or, or it can be kind of light here in lake Erie region and so that it, it fell into this class where we harvest a little earlier and it has some nice balance to it and we we back sweeten just a touch to to or we'll stop the ferment if it's if it's right if we actually do let it get higher bricks um depending on the year i mean we let the kind of i don't want to pigeonhole every wine into itself we let the year kind of take it and dictate where we're taking it in the cellar mm -hmm. well but. it's certainly uh priced very reasonably 15 15 20 yep yeah it's uh we were not trying to break the bank with it uh we want this as kind of your gateway entry into our introduction to our wines um, and we move, we move quite a bit of this. We got about eight acres of uh, Pinot Grigio alone um, and 
I use about uh, two thirds of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for you, I'm gonna ask the same question. If you had to plant five acres this year, what would you plant? Um, I, I'd go to Chardonnay. Uh, we, Chardonnay. Uh, it's a Julia. Um, it's for whatever reason, I mean, at one point we had uh, close to 20 acres of Chardonnay. Um, that was a lot of it for Woodbury back in their time that they planted. Um, and we have some traditional sparkling Chardonnay clones that it may, we used to just go in our standard Chardonnay and now it goes into our, we do a traditional method Chardonnay alone now with that sparkling clone which is fantastic. I mean, it's just really nice. Um, but that year after year after year has uh, the demand for from both the tasting room and from, um, we sell a lot of grapes to other wineries and other producers as well. Um, there, the demand is there. Uh, I want to say, I think the ABC is over. I think that anything but Chardonnay is, is done. And even if it's secretly not, it, it's coming back. And um, uh, yeah, I, I would go Chardonnay. Plus, those vines are a bit older for us. Uh, through attrition, they're not not cropping that heavy, so um, we might change up some clones and, and go that way and um, just modify things. But yeah, I, we we've been we've been forever since about 2000. We've been slowly changing over as we found more about clones or our, our vineyard locations, um, and. and you know, we're always about one or two years behind the curve as far as we get it in the ground because we think there's a demand, then everyone else has it in the ground, and then we have too much, and then we're pulling out and replanting, right. um, but or just refreshing or finding things right. out. So there's a couple of questions for you. Um, one was uh, about the residual sugar on this wine, and one was about uh, the kind of oak barrels that you use. So the RS on the Pinot Grigio on this vintage was a uh, 1.25 RS. Um, so I think this is a little sweeter than our typical, we're usually around one, but uh, we found this was a nice, nice point amongst the group. Um, and then oak barrels, uh, we're using French, American, and Hungarian, uh, about 11 different Coopers, um, that we use, uh, Cooper being, I always take the analogy, like a car, you have a Ford, you can have a, a Mercury or a Ford, um, uh, you have a um, Mercier or you have a uh, Cadu and that's the different producers making the same vessel, which is a barrel. Um, and they have their different techniques or different uh, little nuances that help to influence the wine. But yeah, we're, we're always mixing that in and trying different things. We have about 100 and, 150 to 175 barrels uh, that we use in house here. Um, it was a little lean there after I think 2018, 19, and then we ramped up 2020. It was fantastic. And I wasn't going to buy many barrels. And then we said, <laughs> I was late, late to order and said, yeah, we need to load up. Uh, this looks to be a great year. And now tasting through some of these 2020 reds, we're, we're quite happy that we did load up. Cool. Well, that's excellent. Well, thank you, Chris. Um, and good job. I think it's really uh, neat that you've taken a, a family legacy and kind of expanded it and updated it for the 21st century. And um, I hope you have a, a wonderful 2021 season. And maybe one of these years before I retire, I'll actually make it out to your area. To meet I mean, it is the West Coast. If you want to head West, uh, come <laughs> <on>. <laughs> um, we're the cool part. You know, it's, it's all convertibles and feet up uh, over here on the West Coast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're all Maseratis and Lamborghinis here. <laughs> right, Thomas? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, unless there are any other questions, I'd like to uh, thank all the panelists. You, you know, it's really, um, really impressive to see the, the things going on in New York, the variety and the dedication and the hard work that everyone puts into these wines, both on the vineyard side and the winery side. Um, it always really impresses me. It's, it's a great industry. It's a learning experience. It's humbling, but I think that's one reason that we're all, we're all in it because it's, uh, it's something new every year. So best of luck in 2021. Um, I'd like to thank Rebecca Johnson of O'Donnell Lane who has kept us all organized and on time with this event. 
And I'd also like to thank the New York Wine and Grape Foundation for sponsoring this. They have a whole series of, of webinars that they've been having, uh, I think before this and uh, uh, a few coming up as well. So I'm sure they're listed on their website. So thanks to them. Just thank you again for all the attendees who joined us today. And uh, thank you to you, Alice, and to Julia, Cameron, Peter, Thomas, and Chris uh, for a terrific session, very educational and uh, informative and, and light and fun. As a reminder, we hope you will join us for our next upcoming event in the Varietal Series, which is on Wednesday, May 19th at 4 o'clock p.m. with Everything is Coming Up Rosé with Wanda Mann. Thank you to all of you and have a great rest of your day.